Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you join us here today. Hi, Carrie. I'm excited to be here. Good. So I have so many questions for you. I'm really intrigued by your story. Um, could you maybe start by just giving our listeners some backstory life that led you up to where you are now in coaching and maybe tell mm-hmm. us where you are in the world too? Yes. So I live in Greenville, South Carolina. I've lived most of my life in the Southern US, although my husband and I did live in Canada for a number of years. And I have been a nature lover all of my life. So nature and books and spirituality, those are like the three things I've carried with me all along. And a number of years ago, I was trying to figure out, well, first I was an English teacher. So I was like, I'll follow my love of books, but my nature love kept on being like, what about me? And so I went to grad school for soil science and I studied sustainable agriculture and I loved it. And I I kept on diving deeper into it. I wanted to know as much as I could about how do we grow our food without pesticides. I feel it's one of the solutions that covers a lot of different areas and problems out there. Like with one thing, you can solve a lot of things. Mm, Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons I got really deep into it because I just was like, if we're going to come up with a solution, let's find the best solution. And so I got my degree and then it was a little bit after uh, 2009, 2008, the recession in the US. So I was highly qualified for jobs, but I would apply somewhere and they'd tell me, oh, we got 50 to 100 applicants. Yes. And, and, I, and I felt like it was this weird place of, I tried so long and now I have the credentials, but there's hundreds of people applying yeah. for one job. And um, so then I went back to teaching and, and when I had my first child, I decided my husband and I had decided I was going to stay at home with her, be a homesteader and, and live the life. Now I will say homesteading was my dream. It was not my husband's dream. Um, And pretty early on into it, I realized I didn't really like just staying home with my daughter. It wasn't engaging enough for me. I know some people that's everything they want and more, but it was a big reality shock, wake up call to me, like six, nine months into it. I felt like this is not, I'm not suited for this lifestyle of being a stay at home mom. And, and so then I started freelancing and I started teaching other people about organic gardening and that over the course of a couple of years that led to then I started life coaching because I realized a lot of people wanted me to give them permission to start as much as they wanted me to tell them, how do you care for your tomatoes? When do I plant my carrots? How do I make broccoli grow? Because I, I, yes, I was conveying the, the information to them about caring for their plants, but sometimes it felt like a lot of our conversation was me just encouraging them. It's okay to start. It's okay to make mistakes. Everybody has plants die. Even if you're skillful at it, I still have plants that die and I've been doing this for 30 some years. And, and so I, and, and it made me reflect back on my teaching days as I thought, okay, when I was in the classroom, it was really about seeing people's potential, bringing it out, motivating them, even when they're not motivated and finding that point of connection that helps them get to the next place. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it now? Like how, um, our old lives always somehow kind of create this stepping stone and enter our new lives in in such a way. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so even as I started over time, segueing away from organic garden coaching and more into life coaching. People around me, some of them, even if they were supportive, they didn't really get why I was switching Mm because they said, well, you're so good at garden coaching and you understand it. And this is where all your expertise is. And you can just rattle off facts about cucumbers like nobody's business. (laughs) Uh Um, But, you know, in my heart, it started feeling like I needed to do 
more or I needed something different. And I've always been very intuitive. So I just kept on following that intuitive thread, that pull that was leading me go broader. Don't just work with people in their gardens, like work with people in other ways. And, and so even though some of the people around me didn't really understand why they felt like, oh, you have this great thing that you're just setting it down and moving on to this other great thing that you have no foundation for. But I felt like I wanted to do the thing that was following my calling, following where I was being led. And, um, and it's still like this dedication to noticing what feels right to me is one of the things that when I work with clients, that's what I'm working with them on is, is following what feels right to them. Um, because so many of us for, for our early years with parents and school and all this, everyone else is telling us how to do things and how to be and how to behave and how to talk and all of those things that if we're not careful, we can lose our own voice and lose our own dedication and loyalty to trusting our own instincts and our own calling and our own needs. And so now when I work with people, that's one of the things that I keep on returning to. And in a way I feel it's like I can tend to plants and help them grow or I can work with people and help them grow. And some of the same ideas work in both places of course I don't put fertilizer on any of my clients right. that. <laughs> it'd be so much easier though wouldn't it yeah <laughs> sprinkle the fairy dust <laughs> yeah I definitely want to get back to that topic of intuition and I just talked to a friend yesterday who I happen to um, have interviewed here about mm. the subject so I'm going to come back to that and about your okay. coaching and how you approach it but I have to jump back into the homesteading because yes I always had this kind of fascination and interest in it. Um, And I know other women want to know and are probably listening to this and saying, wait a second, I want to know about that. Yeah. Um, Also. So what I I know what drew you to homesteading because of your Mm -hmm. background and and because you always had that love of nature. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm an English teacher as well. And I think that we have that creative side to us that pulls us in these um, what some people might say crazy directions. Right. But I like Mm -hmm. to refer to as creative. Um, So when you got into the homesteading, you were staying home with your daughter. So what, what was homesteading like? Did you buy a new Mm -hmm. property? Um, did you work with your existing property? What did you do as a homesteader? Mm, yeah, great question. So for years, I had been wanting my own piece of land. And not that land ownership has to be the goal, but I knew for me, I wanted to have full freedom to do what I wanted to do without somebody else telling me I could or I couldn't. You know, beyond the law, of course. Right. I, I get that we, we have some laws about what you do with your land. <laughs> yeah. And and so we had bought a house and it didn't have the the amount of land that I wanted, although in hindsight it was fine. But we had right around a third of an acre, and a lot of it was shaded. Uh, because we had when we first bought the property, I think there were about 10 or or nine trees on there, large oak trees that were full grown. And so our whole front yard and a lot of the backyard were shaded. So when we first bought our property, there was probably like a 20 by 20 area that was lawn that could be, that was sunny, but the rest of it was all shade. And so I started out just working with what I had. I had somebody come out with a tiller, they tilled it up. From my background in in school and all that I learned now, like I till to begin with, but then I follow what's called a no-till method that after the first year, you don't till, you just add things in and it kind of mimics what might happen in a natural landscape of things falling from trees and, you know, resting on the ground and then decomposing in that way. And so I had a vegetable garden. I love strawberries. So I planted a strawberry patch and Every year I proceeded to add to the garden and, and some of our trees had issues. So then we got them taken down. And also I was always, if an arborist came out, I always say, can you look at this tree? Cause I really want to plant a garden here. So if yeah. you can give me a reason to take this down, I will. <laughs> um, and we, we also were on a very small budget because 
we were a one income family. I, my husband and I, as I said, we had lived in Canada, but then we moved back. So we spent almost all of our money moving. And yeah, I, when I was in grad school, I wasn't really making money. So we were pretty much starting out with nothing. And then we were on one income. So we didn't have much money to work with. Uh, but every dollar that I made from garden coaching, I would go use to buy plants. That was yeah. my other motivator was every time I met with a client, I was like, oh, good. I get to buy some more yeah. plants. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so every year I would add a few more garden beds. And every year we took down more trees. So there was more sun and we got chickens when my daughter was around two and we had those in the backyard. And I also, I was reading, I can give you later some resources of books that I've read. I mean, in my lifetime, I've probably read hundreds of gardening books. And, and then there are some that are focused on homesteading and permaculture. Yeah. So I've read a lot of those. And so pretty early on, I started putting in as many fruit bearing plants as I could, because my goal was, I want to have fruit from springtime to fall. As long as it's the growing season, I want to have something producing. Mm -hmm. And I did achieve that goal. And in a way, I feel like that was the thing that I accomplished that I would still try and replicate. I live in a different home now, but I, I still have strawberry plants, blueberry bushes, blackberry, and raspberry. And at our old house, I had all of those and some other lesser known gooseberries and currants. And I feel like I'm forgetting now. There was probably more, but I had a list at one point. And then we had fruit trees as well, apple and peach and pear and cherry. And, you know, I could kind of go on. If, if there's a fruit that'll grow, then I had it. Yeah. And, um, and, and then I had all of these garden beds. So at its height, it was 22 garden beds. Oh, it's like a dream for me. I love gardening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And around uh, our number of chickens fluctuated, but typically we had somewhere between six to 10 and, um, and then all the various fruit trees and bushes and then herbs. And I really, I loved it, but it also started creating some friction in my relationship because my husband was raised on a farm. And early on, he and I both knew we didn't want to create a farm. We just wanted to do a homestead, but it was very hard to figure out like, where does a homestead end and a farm begin? Yeah. And like, what is our happy place with that? And, and I realized that the further we got into this journey, I really love growing things. I really love nurturing the plants. I love picking fruit, but being having a mom and a business and putting up the food like when you have to can it or dry yeah. it or freeze it that whole part of it the preservation part I for some reason I'm just terrible at I'm not and it's not that I don't know how to do it but it's almost like great I've got two gallons of strawberries and now I have to do something with them very quickly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and and when you've got a big garden it's like that continuous constant. Yeah. Yeah. And so over time, I started realizing I'm not really great at this part of it. And then we would have these huge harvests and I would be calling or texting everyone I knew. Can you come take some of these things from us? Because yeah. we have too, too many grapes or too many things of lettuce, which sounds like are actually a good problem to have, but it, and it is, but you feel bad when half of it rots right. because you didn't get to it because, you know, maybe mm -hmm. my kid got sick or, or, or maybe we had to travel. Um, I mean, not that we had to, but, you know, maybe we're going on vacation and it's like yeah. it then planning out how the garden fits in with being gone for a week right no kidding that's their element it does and I have noticed that in the last couple of years too you have to like almost hire somebody to come over and care for mm -hmm. your garden like you would your pets or anything else mm -hmm. yes and so I would depending on what was coming in I might tell some of my best friends I mean when there were strawberries or blackberries oh they came over they yeah. had no problem visiting um and I would have people come and check on the chickens but I 
I, I love having chickens, but it's also, we got to a point where we just had to really look at like, what are the trade-offs and what are the things that are most important to us? And, and when I was coaching with people about gardening, this is always what I talked about too, because I'm really all about starting small and really growing the things that either are going to grow the easiest and you know you'll have success and you like them or the things that you love the most that you're you're willing to put in effort because you love that fruit or vegetable so much right um and I just our production of of what was going on was kind of too much for me to manage and it was so many working parts that I just after time realized like it's not I was always trying to get my husband to help which is fine but he didn't really it wasn't his wasn't his passion thing, yeah. project yeah and and so over time I realized okay maybe I should actually I started growing less of the veggies in the in the last few years we were there and and more just let it be what it was and have a few smaller beds um, because otherwise it just felt overwhelming. And I started mm. realizing like the areas in which I had weaknesses were not complementing the environment that I had set up. And like, at one point we got rid of our chickens because we realized, well, one, they got attacked a dog, even mm. though our area was fenced in a neighbor's dog came and killed at this point, we had 15 chickens. And a dog came in and killed half of our flock in one day. Mm. And it was so sad to walk in the backyard. And there were just dead chicken bodies lying everywhere. Yeah. And the ones that hadn't been killed were freaked out. Yeah. And I, I don't blame them. And that, that was one of the first moments I had been thinking, maybe this is getting out of, this is too much for us to handle. Yeah. And when that happened, I thought, okay, it's fun when the, when I'm, we're raising the chickens and they're walking around the backyard clucking and, and all of that, like when it's really good, it's good. But then when you have to dig a hole to bury all the dead chickens or a chicken is sick, that's the part of being a homesteader that I started feeling wasn't really my love of it. Yeah. And also, I mean, I, I hope your listeners won't be grossed out. I won't go into gory detail, but I did uh, kill chickens to eat them and that was a process that I'm proud that I did it but I felt like my some of my friends started treating me differently like I was <laughs> ex-murderer and right. I'm like if you're eating chicken you really can't judge me for yeah. you know handling it myself here uh, but it just I'm not I was raised vegetarian and I'm not really of the type of personal makeup that I can kill a chicken and not not be feel really it. emotional about right, it. Right, right. Yeah, I and, can relate to a lot anybody. of that. Yeah, I think um, it would be difficult. And I think sharing your story is really important because there are people, women still today who think it would be so fun to create a homestead. But mm -hmm. the reality, the reality is very, very different mm -hmm. once you get into it. And really, um, I, I like that you started out coaching too, so mm -hmm. that you could not convince, but um, persuade people to start small and not buy all these animals and be irresponsible mm -hmm. with it too, because that can be a problem as well. Yes. I can see that all around me. And then people just give up and it's like, wait a second, you also have these animals too. Right. right. Yes. And, and different maybe than a dog or a cat sometimes. Yeah finding a way to move on farm animals is actually harder because not as many yeah, people have them. Of course. Yeah. Where, where I live, when I was ready to sell them, I knew enough people because I'd been raising chickens for so long. And in the area where I was, I had just connected with enough, enough other chicken farmers or not farmers really, but homesteaders like myself that I had enough people that I could reach out and say, I'm sure. selling my chickens for, you know, reduced price. Here's what it goes for. Um, and, and I will say like, that's one of the things too, which is if you're going to homestead, having some type of network or getting connected into other people around you who are doing it is essential um, yeah. because things like this will happen. You need a tool or a supply 
that maybe you can't get or it's not going to come right away or you need to move on your produce or move on your chickens. It's nice when you have the people that you can connect to who are also doing similar things and understanding and you can share that learning experience because even though online is great, it, it's nice to be able to talk to somebody about sure. it. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of move over into what you're doing now mm -hmm. with coaching women um, starting, you know, you started with the gardening. I think that's great. And that, and I really liked that it led you to um, really giving people it, that theme of, of needing permission, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. we, and I see this across different, I've talked to a lot of different coaches and this comes up all the time is they say, you know, sometimes people just need permission to do something. And it's not like you're really giving them permission, but sometimes they just need to hear someone speak it out loud to give them that um, courage to take the first step. So starting with intuition, um, I was just talking to, to the friend yesterday about this. And I actually asked her, what does she actually is an intuitive so she mm -hmm. has like that you know extreme, oh i am as well you know i, didn't oh, that, I love it yeah i'm I a, yeah i'm an intuitive like and that. a psychic yeah yes so i love that and um i asked her what does it sound like for you or what is it what how how are you receiving these messages right because i've just noticed that in my own life for the last year or so really I'm finally listening to my own intuition. And for years, I, I chased it. What, you know, what is it? What am I supposed to be doing? What does that sound like? Is somebody going to write me a letter? Like, what's happening here? <laughs> but really, it's like your own voice. I described it to her as your own voice kind of almost beside you, just uh -huh. giving you a very clear answer to something or a clear idea. And now I just say, oh, that's a great idea. And I do it. And those are the things that work out really well. What does that look like for you? She said it was very similar to mm -hmm. my experience. Yes. And well, this is great. So I, it can show up differently for different yeah. people. So some people, it is almost like you either hear it in your head or you feel like you hear it. And sometimes that happens for me. Also, sometimes it's a feeling and it's just, I think culturally people will say it's like a gut feeling that you have. Mm -hmm. Because our body, I believe, is very connected to our intuition. Your body is going to notice something before your conscious mind is going to notice it. And so sometimes there's people or situations or whatever that just give you a funny feeling, but you can't really put your finger on it. That is your intuition giving you a funny feeling, yeah. kind of giving you a nudge like something's going on here. Yeah, I call uh, that energy. It's either good energy yeah, or bad energy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it can happen that way. Sometimes for me, I will have, so I'm a very vivid dreamer and, and I teach dream interpretation as well. And so I will have dreams that give me intuitive insight or other people might experience it as you wake up and you know something or like you have a decision that you want to sleep on and then you're like okay I'm going to sleep on this and then I'll have the clarity of mind tomorrow after yeah. I sleep on it okay that I believe is yeah. also your intuition speaking to you and all of these things coming together while you're sleeping your subconscious is finding a way to talk to your brain and be like okay let's all get on board here here's the decision um and so that it can happen in that way, but for somebody who's maybe not sure what their intuition looks like, I would say you can do two things. One, you can look back at moments in your life where you feel like you knew something strongly and either you did it or you didn't do it. Like yeah. maybe it's, you knew you should go out with that person or you knew you should say yes if they, they proposed or you knew you should break up with that person. Like yeah. a lot of times with interpersonal relationships, we can notice those feelings or big life decisions like where to go to college or where yeah. to move to a city or, or something of that nature. Like a lot of times I find we are getting the information. It's just a matter of paying attention to it. Absolutely. And and so you can sometimes look back and think, okay, I did have that. Cause I think we all have intuitive ability and, and some people like myself and your friend have it even more to a heightened degree where we can work with other yes. people with it as well. Um, 
but anyone can develop that skill set for themselves because I believe it's a it's a part of our makeup. It's a part of who we are, and and it's been with us throughout all of human history. And sometimes maybe it's been a thing that was taught more about or valued about more or some, I, I feel like these days, maybe we're coming back to a trend of it being more important and more valued, um, but just being open to starting to, like you mentioned, the energy of something. Mm -hmm. If you wanna develop it, just give yourself opportunities throughout your day or throughout your week where you say, I'm gonna start noticing how I feel about something without judging it, just giving myself a time to notice how I feel. Yeah. Because you probably are having lots of impressions about things throughout the course of the day, but if you're used to not paying attention to them, then, you, then you're just used to not even noticing it and it just keeps on sweeping by. Um, but the reasons, why I said you might notice it for the really big decisions in your life is because those are the moments that you remember so yes. strongly. You described it perfectly. And those are really good tips for someone. I'm glad we actually got into that, that subject a little deeper and finding yeah. out that you have psychic abilities is actually very cool. Yeah. Oh, and I'll share one other super quick tip that sure. probably also I feel like is good for our mental health and well-being as well mm -hmm. is and this might also be a tip that for some people it might be hard to do. I don't think it's a it's a difficult other than discipline of making yourself do it is giving yourself more breathing room in your schedule, making sure that your day is not jam packed morning to night, burning the candle at both ends. Like I understand certain seasons of life inevitably have that, but if all of your life has that, then you're losing, you're losing that breathing space. You're losing that quiet time in which you can receive information. And also like, frankly, we, we need to relax more. Yeah. And it's funny. I was just talking to someone else about this um, last week about having, she was telling me that she stopped scheduling everything on Fridays. She doesn't have, she calls it white space. Oh, nice. um, yes. And I really like that white space. It's, it's her time. It's time for her to think mm -hmm. and anything can come up during that time, but it's quiet time to let ideas flow to, um, to just kind of channel her own creativity without everything yes. in so much. So I like that you're mentioning that too. And I had told her that I actually just cleared Fridays for the most part from my schedule. Now I used to awesome. do some teaching every morning. Um, most mornings, but I cleared Friday. I thought I, I want that day to be just for me to have writing mm -hmm. ideas come through and to allow that to happen. I'm still going to get up at the same time at the crack of dawn, but this time it, that's like my white space. So yes. You know, oh, I love that, that you're doing that. I do mine on Mondays and I started doing it when my daughter was little. And for me, I think it's almost, you know, how some people work out in the morning. Cause they're like, yeah. if I work out in the morning, I know I'll do it. That's why I have it as Monday. Cause if I make it Friday, it does not happen that day. Yeah. That's a good idea. And, and yeah. I make it Monday and typically no one can schedule a call with me that day. I don't schedule anything. And a lot of time, if you were in my house with me, I'm in my home office right now, although listeners probably don't know, but um, if you were in my home with me, it might just look like I'm puttering around my house. Yeah. Like organizing, putting things away, mm -hmm. doodling around on my desk, organizing my computer's desktop, whatever. And sometimes I get into bigger things, a writing project or something longer. But a lot of times I feel like it, it may not actually look like I'm doing a lot. I sit out on my porch a lot and just look at the trees. Mm -hmm. and, and yet that time is so essential for having time to remember things that when you're rushing from moment to moment, it, it's easy to forget. And, and I found out they actually have shown, they've done some scientific studies that say we need about 30 minutes a day of when we're doing nothing, quote unquote, to actually have these creative ideas, to be able to synthesize things and, and, and have new 
ideas, decisions, all of that. And, yeah. you know, for some people, it might be meditation. Um, as I said, I like to do it outside. I have a program I created called Nourish with Nature that's all about five minutes of mindfulness outside every day or looking outside every day to start to create that habit of quiet space and the white space in your schedule. Really nice. I like that. Nourish with Nature is a nice, um, a nice name for it too. Thanks. So we are getting close to um, having to, to end the podcast. So I'm going to just select a couple of questions because oh, I sure. could keep going and going. Let's do, um, I always ask this one, what has been your mm. greatest challenge so far in your journey leading mm. you to where you are now? And then on the flip side of that, what is your, or what has been your greatest joy? Yes. Well, I will say parenting has been my greatest challenge. <laughs> And I, I just thought going into it that I would be in school. I was always so great in terms of like model student type of thing. For some reason, I thought parenting would go like that too. And it still surprises me that it's not like that. <laughs> and even in the past couple of weeks, I have a three-year-old and he's had sleep trouble his whole life. And, and he, we go to a pediatric sleep doctor and they're a little bit stumped by him too. And, and some of the time I'm like, you know, it just shows me that you really can't ever make, I mean, I'm sure some parents have an easy time with it, but for me, it has not been easy and it, it stretches. I, I mean, I grow from it. It's all good growth, but if I had to choose it, I probably wouldn't choose some of the challenges yeah. that parenting brings up. For sure. Yeah. And I know that's pretty broad. I mean, I could get more. No, specific, no, I too. think that's, that's a great answer because there are women who are probably afraid to say that, that parenting is a challenge for them because yeah. there's always this fear of, am I failing? Am I? No, you're just recognizing that it's hard. You know, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people feel the same way. Exactly. And I will say in, in the past couple of weeks, I've been really, really honest with people who I don't normally say like, oh, this is so hard. And it has felt so freeing because mm -hmm. I almost felt that until then I was, I, I don't want to say pretending that I had it together, but my son in various ways, many times has made me think, why can I not handle this? Like, yeah. I feel like I should be capable of this. Yep. And, and right now we're working with a behavior specialist. And luckily a couple of years back, I was talking to one of my friends on the phone about my parenting experience and she works with exceptional children. And she started, she was the first one who made me think maybe your child has needs beyond what you can meet. Not in yeah. a bad yeah. way about me, but just like, maybe he has exceptional needs. Sure. Um, and, and it just started making me feel like, oh, I don't actually have to keep on every day telling myself, why can't you do this? Like, maybe there's actual reason. I, yeah. I've never learned how to work with somebody who has whatever he has. We, we don't, he doesn't have a diagnosis yet other yeah. than sensory processing disorder, but, um, you know, he's still yeah. young. So as he grows, he, he might get a diagnosis, but even just being once she told me that I started looking into getting more professionals helping us, an yeah. occupational therapist, early intervention, all of these things. And even though it didn't change everything right away, I stopped believing that it was all on my shoulders to right. fix everything and bringing in all the help just felt amazing. And, and, you know, it's ironic because when I coach people, I, one of the biggest things we talk about is self-talk. And, 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 but my self-talk was so bad, but I was kind of like mired in it that I, I didn't really know how to change it because every day felt hard and I had nobody else helping me. I mean, yeah. there were people helping, but not in the way that was helping the situation get better. Sure. Yeah. So what would you say has been your greatest joy? Mm, greatest joy. I mean, I know a lot of people would say they're kids and my kids are lovely, <laughs> but, but um, I don't want to just say that because that's a cliche answer. And um, I mean, I do find 
with them or with other people, like seeing people have that, I, you could call it a transformation or almost like a new inspiration and vitality and motivation to, oh, now I'm going to tackle this thing. Or uh, the flip side of what I felt when my friend told me, uh, you know, maybe your kid has exceptional needs, like, oh, wait a minute, like taking that burden off and feeling empowered to do something and get help. Like I, one of my greatest joys is when I do that with other people. Um, so in the past couple of months, I started doing psychic readings and it makes me feel like I used to feel when I did the garden consultations, when mm. I first started that yeah. eight years ago, of uh, I feel like I'm walking on a cloud and I'm like, people are paying me to do this. This is so amazing. And, and everyone at the end of the session is feeling so good mm -hmm. because of a, a lot of times uh, people are coming to me because they have something going on in their business where they have to make a decision yeah. or it, it's a new thing they're creating or a new program they're joining or I mean, sometimes people come to me for non-business reasons as well, personal things that they want to look into, but uh, it's so exciting when, because of that process together, the person feels really empowered and energized and inspired. And it, it's being a part of that and seeing how they feel excited about life makes me excited about life. And then I feel like it's just this cycle of everybody smiling and feeling really pumped up. Wow. Good. So I am going to ask you now where we can find you online. I do want to know about different books and things, and I know you have a lot mm -hmm. of books that you can recommend. So what I'm hoping that you can do is maybe in the comments, when I post the, the YouTube video, yes. if you're able to list the, the books, I think that would be yes. helpful. And then people can just click on them. I will um, do that. I'll list homesteading or gardening books yeah. and personal development. Yes. I want other to inspiring both. books. Yep. yep. So where yeah. can we find you online? All right. Well, I'm at rachelstravelli.com and on most platforms that it's my name as well. Instagram, okay. YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest. Actually, I need to double check my Pinterest is that, but yeah, you can find me in those places at my name and that's the easiest way to do it. Perfect. I'll make sure I leave that in the notes in the podcast and also on the YouTube video. So everyone can, can go and read more about you and see what your services are. So thank you so much, Rachel. It has been just uh, a pleasure to talk to you today and get to know you a little better. Thank you, Carrie. This was so fun.